Would you all please pray with me? Father, as I reach out to speak, to speak through me, to bring comfort to those who sit before me, because you love them deeply. And so, Lord, I ask that you would speak clearly this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a pastor I knew that when he would introduce himself out in public and people didn't know him, he wouldn't tell him he was a pastor. He would tell him he was a heart doctor. I don't know if I really agreed with that. I think it's still a lie. But, you know, in a sense, pastors are kind of heart doctors in a sense that we deal with issues of the heart. So maybe we're not cardiologists. Maybe we're cardiologians. I don't know. But I can tell you that issues of the heart is something that is dear to me and something that I pray for you all frequently. And I realize that when the holidays come, it's a great time. I mean, Thanksgiving, then Christmas and New Year, it's just a festive, wonderful time. Families gather together, friends gather together, people we've not seen for decades, maybe more, gather together. But if there's somebody missing, the pain runs deep, doesn't it? And that's what I've realized through the years is that at times like this, we have extreme joy, but extreme pain too. Because those reminders of those empty seats around the table and those memories of yesteryear really encourage us amidst the tears of missing. And it brings a time of pain as well as a time of goodness. And so this message is for all of us. Maybe you're going through some pain right now. Maybe you will be. But what I would like for you to do is have your Bibles out and a piece of paper because I may hit on something that you will want to write down a scripture reference so that you can go to it when you need it. Our pain has a way of visiting us in the middle of the night, sometimes just waking us up. And you can't call the pastor then. You need to have it right in front of you. When we're dealing with hurting hearts, it's comforting to know that God says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. Isaiah wrote those words, and God told him what to write there. So as we read that, and we say, well, that's fine for you, Isaiah. I want you to realize that God told him to write that so that you would hear it. You weren't the original audience. Israel was. But he intended it for you and me today as well. And so there's an immediate audience, but there's also us. So you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all those uh, whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. And so perfect peace, complete peace, genuine peace, that place of contentment, that place where there's no friction, that place where you're at rest. You can find that in God. He says so. Fix your thoughts on him. But we say that sounds fine. But when I lose someone, where do I go? When I'm anxious, where do I go? When I'm fearful, where do I go? What do I do? It's not a magic feeling. God works through his word. And he wants you to go to his word and find what he has to say to you at that time. And there are scriptures that I've read and you've read for years. And then one time you read it and it jumps off the page. Something you've seen before, but it never occurred to you. That's the living word. That's the living word. That's God saying, look at this. I'm opening up your mind now to this. That's why you need to know and why you need to read your scripture. They're love letters from God. It's not an acad just an academic exercise. When we lose someone, God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Does that mean God delights in death? No, 
you do realize that death was not God's plan A. We were wired and made and created to live eternally with God. But thanks to, thanks to Adam and Eve, if they didn't mess it up, we would have. Um, we have a limited amount of time on this earth. So God didn't wire us for separation. That's why death is so hard. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Precious, not cheap, not something to be dismissed, but precious, something that God says, okay, this is the time for that one to come to me. It's not, and you've heard it said to other people, well, God just needed them more than you did. Don't, please don't say that to folks because that's so hurtful to the one who's missing that loved one. God takes them at just the right time because they're precious and their life is done. There's only pain ahead and it's their time to come to be with him. And so precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. And so I am reminded that when I lose someone dear to me and they know the Lord is Savior, they're good. They're fine. They're better than they've ever been before. And somehow knowing that their scars are being healed heals my scars of missing them. But the truth is, it leaves us with emptiness and loneliness. And the closer that relationship, the greater the emptiness and the more dank the loneliness. Somebody's missing. They were there and you reach out for them and you talk to them, but they're not there. So what do we do? What help does God give us for the grieving heart? He gives us his spirit, his Holy Spirit to those who have trusted alone in Christ alone, have the Holy Spirit in them to minister to them. But God wants to minister through his word as well. Question is, where can I get relief from this grief? At funerals, we say things to try to comfort other people. We tell them, well, they're in heaven now and they have angels' wings and they're angels and they're looking down on us and they're nice sentiments and people try to comfort us with those things. I just want you to know they're lies. They mean them, but you're never gonna be an angel, nor am I. We're always gonna be human. Is that depressing? It was the first time I heard it. But see, we've never seen humanity the way God made it. We only see humanity as weak and frail and sinful. Boy, if we could see Adam and Eve before they sinned, it'd be like, all right, I like that. That's what I want to be. So God made us to be human. We'll always be human. And I really don't believe people in heaven are looking down on us now. I mean, let's be real. Would heaven be heaven if they could see everything going on right now in your life and everything on the earth? It really wouldn't be heaven, would it? Can they get messages through? I think so. But the truth is, we try to give one another encouragement. And we say those things with, with a good heart, trying to encourage others. But somehow it falls short. So where do you really get relief from the grief? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we see these words. Notice how God refers to himself. Blessed be the God and Father. Huh. So he is God over all, omniscient. He's a father. He's the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You can go to him for comfort. He knows, he cares, he wants you to come to him and who comforts us in all our affliction. And so we go to him. This is something you can call on and say, God, you said you would comfort me. I need that comfort now. Give me that peace. And one thing that he wants for us to do 
and you to do and me for each other is take that comfort that we've learned and use it to help others. Look at what it says. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that for this purpose, we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know this. There are some of you that can walk up to another woman who has lost her husband and say, I know how you feel because you do. You understand it. God has comforted you and you can share that comfort with them. If I walk up to you and I say, I know exactly what you're going through now that you've lost your husband, that's not true because I've not been there. And so we can comfort one another. But what I want you to see here is God refers to himself as the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. How does he carry that comfort out? The psalmist, David, said that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Hebrew actually reads there, Yahweh shepherding me. Now, applicationally, that absolutely is true. I won't argue with the translators. They know a lot more about this than I do. And they know a lot more about Hebrew. But applicationally, Yahweh shepherding me. Actively, daily, you wake up in the morning, he's there to guide you. The question isn't, is he there to guide you? The question is, will you look to him? Do you have the faith to say, I know you will comfort me and I don't know how, but I'm starting my day on my knees before you or in my chair, humbling myself. And if the Lord is your shepherd, daily guiding you, you're good. That's why he says, I shall not want. If God is your shepherd, you're good. He'll comfort you, protect you, watch over you, walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's that good. So where do we find help for the grieving heart? In the God of all comfort. The good shepherd. The generous shepherd. The one who keeps you in perfect peace. That for those who trust him. Isn't that a great graphic of being hugged by the scripture? When we read it, God can reach right out and hug you through his word. And when he shows you something in the word you've not seen before, you get that aha moment and you feel the presence of God. And so help for the grieving heart is there. And I'm just giving you a few verses. There's many, many more. How about help for the fearful heart? You know, some of the greatest fears that are listed um, on, on different, uh, uh, different, in different categories are one, being alone. A fear of being alone, a fear of failure, a fear of rejection, a fear of just change, change that I don't want. And a fear of something bad happening. And there's so many other fears, but we know some of these, right? And some of us, well, there's just a lot more fear in the world today. I talked briefly earlier about the, uh, what we're experiencing today with this, the meanness, a lack of kindness in the world. But there's also a great fear out there now, a fear of getting sick and a fear of, just, we see our, our, our country, we've never been so divided and it seems that some are doing it by design. I talked a little bit about it happening in churches where people are saying, my opinion matters more than yours. And it's like, we might both be wrong. And you know this, wherever your opinion disagrees with God's, guess who's wrong? We are. That's why you hear me preach all the time, love one another. That's what Jesus, Jesus summarized the Old Testament, actually the whole Bible with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Or your strength. And love your neighbor. Love one another. That's what he's called us to do. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's not easy. 
but it is simple. And he'll reward that. So how do we get help for the fearful heart? Psalm 91 uh, reads this way. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High. Notice, not those who visit the shelter of the Most High. Some of us like to visit God on Sundays and then do whatever we want Monday through Saturday. And so we kind of dip in and we dip out. And one pastor puts it this way. um, There are two kinds of uh, tea drinkers. Those who are dippers with their tea bag and those who are dunkers, man, it just stays there and gets immersed. And some folks approach church that way and approach Jesus that way. They're dippers. They dip in on Sunday and they're out. Others are dunkers. They live in the presence of him. This is talking to people who live in the presence of God, dependence on him. Do you realize he actually wants you to be dependent on him? That's hard for us to realize because you were raised like me to be a good, independent American. I don't need anything. Thank you. Truth is, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't even breathe. He's your creator. So those who live in the shelter of the Most High, live in dependence, waking up in the morning and saying, God, here I am. What do you want to do with me today? And those who go to bed at night saying, Lord, was I pleasing to you today? Have I been faithful? What do you think, God? And throughout the day, just little prayers. That's kind of signs that you're getting dependent on him. So those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Notice that you need to be in his shadow. You can't be out doing your own thing. I like to live it, think of it as living under God's umbrella of safety. When I'm living in obedience, I'm living under his protective umbrella. Now, you know as well as I do, if you walk out today and it's pouring, if you walk in under an umbrella, you're not getting poured on, are you? But if you step out from underneath of it, you're going to get wet. It's the same way with God's protection. Walk obediently, do what he says. Walk under his protection. Everybody else might be getting rained on, but you're not. He can protect you. They'll find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge. He's the place where I run. Who do you run to when things go wrong? Where do you get your advice from? I'm learning more and more to go right to God. Now, I do have godly counselors that I go to and people that I trust that I go to and people I know that live for the Lord and they ha- God's given them wisdom and I go there too. He's my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap. Remember, God said this. This is not make-believe stuff and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do you know his promises? I'm giving some of them to you today because I want you to write them down and go to God and say, God, your word says this and I'm counting on you. That's Psalm 91 verses one through four. So help for the fearful heart. Go through Psalm 91, the entire Psalm. And it's not the only one. I remind you, this was, um, these are written by men of experience. So where do I find safety? Psalm 18, two is one that I've learned to hold on to. The Lord is my rock. He's not sand. He's not quicksand. He's rock solid ground. He's my rock. He's my fortress around me, and he's my deliverer. When I need deliverance, I'm out of here. He'll deliver me to where I need to be in a safe place. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn, the strength, the strength of my salvation. He's my stronghold. Now, you can take a good guess who wrote this. David. King David wrote this. Do you know when he wrote it? If we read our Bibles. Our Bible tells us, because there is uh, a, 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 or telling us right above where it is, he wrote this when God had given him freedom from all of his enemies. 
David was a warrior. He's the only one in Israel that would stand up against 10 foot Goliath, nine foot six Goliath. He's the only one that became public enemy number one when he did that. And the jealousy of Saul chased him down. And David was made public enemy number one by the king out of jealousy and ran for his life for somewhere between 10 and 15 years. David knew a little bit about conflict. David knew a little bit. I mean, what was the song of the lady? Saul's killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. And David is a warrior. He's strong. He's agile. He's smart. It's God. He's telling you God is the one who protects him. He's telling you God is his strength. And he's recommending to you and to me. Look to God. Look to him. I often think of this when something comes up in my life. I think of God leaning forward and looking at me and going, is there anything too hard for me? What do you think the answer is? Absolutely not. That's help. And, this, and now let's look at help for the lonely heart. You all know that you can be in a room full of people and still feel alone. Nobody gets you. Just they don't understand you. And so there's a lot of lonely people out there today. It's another thing that COVID has done. It's separated us out. And I hate that. Um, when we were in Texas, we first moved to Texas, I realized this in a, in a real sense. Where we were in Dallas, everybody has alleys. And not only do we have alleys, everybody has a six or an eight foot high fence around their backyard. And so we all drive down the alley, drive into our driveway and into the garage and you never see your neighbors. You never see them. We're all secluded. And yet we're 20, 30 feet away from one another, our houses are, and we don't see each other. That's kind of the way society is today. We're all separated. That's why you need us. That's why I need you. That togetherness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Did you hear that? You call on him and you find he's right there. Say, my child, I'm right here behind you. Just look for me. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. Fear sometimes means you're just downright afraid of what he could do. But a lot of times fear means you take God seriously. You take him seriously. If he says it, you do it, right? To those who take God seriously, I think how what that is uh, is here, and He hears their cries. Those tears you cried last night, He heard them. He collected them in a jar. He's got them. He heard them. He hears their cries for help and rescues them but he rescues you in his time, not ours. That takes faith. I'm still waiting for God to answer some prayers. And it's like, do you hear me? I know this is your will, Lord. It's been years. And I sense a whisper of, just wait, my son, just wait. The Lord protects all those who love him. Do you love the Lord? Amen. Amen? One man does. <laughs> How about the rest of you? Amen. How do we show him? Do what he says. If you love me, you do what I say, right? Didn't Jesus say that? If you love me, you would obey me. Help for the lonely heart. James says it this way, come near to God and he will come near to you. Sometimes we're waiting on God and God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm waiting on you. 
You make the first move here. He is always there. Psalm 27, I love this. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Everybody may abandon you, but he won't because he's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind like men and women do, like we do. He isn't hot on you one day and cold the next. He isn't all flattery for you one day and then the next day it's like, I I don't care if you're alive. And when we're not faithful, he's still faithful. That's the God that we worship in this place. Isn't that a God you want to get close to? Amen? Is this not a great graphic? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Are you drowning in sorrow? Are you drowning in loneliness? Are you drowning in grief? Jesus is reaching through that and reaching down to you as you're going down for the third time saying, I told you I'd never leave you. I told you I'd never forsake you. Come on, my child, take hold of my hand. Where do I find help for the lonely heart? Draw near to God in prayer and in his word. And remember this, the bottom, it's not real legible down here, but we may feel lonely, but we are never alone. Not just this nice sentiment. Isn't that what he said? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, which means you may feel lonely, but you are never alone. Talk to him. Oftentimes I'll ask you all, when you lose a spouse, I'll ask you, say, you still talking to your spouse? And a lot of times you'll say, yeah. You feel silly admitting it, don't you? I don't think there's anything silly about that at all. I think it's therapeutic. Can they hear you? I don't know, probably not. Could Jesus get a message through to them? Yeah, sure could. What I'm driving at, talk to them. Are you hurting? sit down in the living room, see Jesus sitting in the chair and talk to him out loud. It's okay. We're not going to put you in a straight jacket if you do that. Help for the anxious heart. Again, so many worries out there today, so many fears out there. So where do we find help for that anxiety? Cast all your anxiety on him. That's what God told Peter to tell you. Are you anxious about something? Now, oftentimes we'll say, I'm worried about something. And what we mean is, I'm worried about this, meaning I'm concerned about this. So it's good. We need to be concerned about things. But anxiousness is a sin. Anxiousness is that worry on steroids. Anxiousness is saying, God's not involved in this. I'm the only way out of this. Anxiousness takes control. Anxiousness tells you when you're going to sleep and when you're not. Anxiousness will tell you when you're going uh, to eat and when you can't eat. Anxiousness will tell you when you can concentrate and when you can't and what you're going to concentrate on. You get the message. God doesn't want that for you. He's not punishing you. He's saying, child, look to me. Look to me. Cast it on me. I can handle it. I don't know if this is big enough for you to see, but there's somebody carrying this huge sack of anxiety up to this giant hand. God can handle it, and he's willing to. Paul said this to the Philippians. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. So what are we supposed to be anxious about? What's he say? Nothing. So does he just leave you there? Oh, don't worry. No, he doesn't. But, contrast, in, in what things? Everything. Everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so what God is saying, don't worry, pray. When worry hits you, there's your signal. It's time to pray. 
As soon as that worry comes in, pray. Give it to God with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, that you can hear me. Thank you, Lord, that you have this under control. Thank you, Lord, that you will handle this for me. And the peace of God, that peace that we started out with, with Isaiah, that complete, genuine peace for the person who keeps their mind stayed on God, there's that peace. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Have you ever been in a situation where people are saying, you should be worried about this, and you say, I got perfect peace. Many years ago, I had to go in for a back surgery, and you know if you go in for a surgery, they gotta tell you, here's this long list of things that could happen to you, and they're all bad, right? You could be blind, you could die, you could do this, you could do that, and it's like, operating on my back. How am I going to be blind to do that? But they got to cover everything. Patty was worried. She was nine months pregnant with our third child. And I'm going to be paralyzed? Well, wait a second. She started to experience extreme anxiety and she took it to the Lord. And the Lord gave her peace. And she told me, she said, I got perfect peace. If you walk in and they wheel you out, I'm okay with that. I said, great, I'm not. <laughs> I need some of that peace myself. Actually, the Lord did give me peace in that. That's the kind of peace he can give. But it takes us going to him and presenting it to him. That peace will go above any, what anybody can understand because it's not natural peace. It's a supernatural peace. And then he'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. He'll actually put guards, and that's the word. He'll put guards right around you. That's the word they used to use for guarding a city. Those guards that would guard the city in a time of battle, God will provide those kinds of guards, his guards, to guard your mind. And the last one here, help for the empty heart. I call it the empty heart. It might be the troubled heart, but maybe you just can't find peace any place. And so many of us these days, well, we're looking at all kinds of ways to get to God to get some kind of peace. We go with good works, religion, morality, philosophy, and we can't get there. Some of us are building up this uh, pile of rocks of good works saying, well, surely if I get enough good works here, God has to let me into heaven and he has to give me peace. Just the question is, how many good works does it take to get into heaven? And what if you fall one short? That means you're gonna spend an eternity in hell. Interesting what um, several have said. St. Augustine is credited with this one. Uh, and so is others. Blaise Pascal is another one. There is a God-shaped vacuum in every man that only Christ can fill. And we try to shove everything into that vacuum. Maybe it's, um, uh, it, it's career or money uh, or overall wealth or status. or We try to stuff everything. We all have tried these things some more than others, and nothing satisfies. Oh, it does for a little while, but it won't satisfy. The Bible says this about trying to get peace with God. The Bible says that for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. When it says we've sinned, it means that we've fallen short. We missed the target. And that's what this is showing you here. See all those arrows, none of them hit the bullseye, did they? That's your life. That represents your life and my life right there. Well, all these good works that we're trying to do and all those arrows fall short, none of them hit. And that's what God is saying. And we say, well, God, what was the standard? And God says, well, if you wanna hit the bullseye, that means you have to be perfect. Well, what if I'm not? Sorry for the graphic photo, but the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God for eternity. That's what the word means in Hebrew and in Greek, separation. But God didn't stay there. He was the first mover. And he came to you. And he came to me. And he came to all of us. 
See, the Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What does that look like? He exchanged his life for you. And so what that looks like is here. Let's assume for a second that this is you and the doctor has just told you, I'm sorry, you're gonna die. I'm sorry, you have terminal cancer and we can't do anything about it, we'll make you comfortable. But just at that moment, I walk into the room and I say, hey doc, could you take their cancer and put it in me and take my good organ and put it in them? You. And the doctor says, well, we certainly could. And so they take your cancer that's killing you and they put it in me, what happens to me? Yeah, not a trick question, right? So they took my good, my good part, and they put it in you. What happens to you? You live, don't you? You could say that I died in your place. You were the one that should have died, and I died in your place. It's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He went to the cross, and he took on himself your cancer and my cancer called sin. And he paid it all. He paid it all. I never get tired of sharing this because each time I do, it floods me with that warmth and that reminder that Jesus died for me. And I know that I know that I know that when I die, I'll go to heaven because he paid the ticket. He gave me his life and he did it for you too. But the question is not what he has done, but what you will do. Will you trust him? He requires that. He requires for you to accept that exchange. This is what he says. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith in this, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is by grace, unmerited favor. We talked about that earlier. God is giving you something you don't deserve and me. You've been saved. Saved from what? Saved from death. Saved from hell. Through faith. It's trusting alone in Christ alone. It's why you always hear me say it that way. And this not from yourselves. You can't work for it and you can't purchase it. God set it up that way. It's by trusting him. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Have you gone to God and asked him? Have you had that conversation with him to say, God, I understand I can't get there on my own. Right now I'm trusting alone in Jesus. And so we have, I've given you verses here that you can go to if you have an anxious heart, if you have a grieving heart, if you have a lonely heart. And there's so many other things we could talk about, but I picked those out for today because I think that's what the Lord wanted you to hear. You now have scriptures you can go to. But right now you might feel a need that you want to talk to somebody just briefly. Maybe you would like to um, recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you'd like to trust Christ. Maybe you have something in your life. You just want somebody to pray for you right now. Right now, I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to have two of our elders come up. I've asked Patty to come up. If you, for the next few minutes, I would like for you to come up and have us pray for you. Kareen, if you would play some music for us. Uh, soft music while we'll give you some time to come on up and let us pray for you. Uh, we'll turn the lights up. But the Bible says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. So now I invite you up. Who would like to come up and have us pray for you? Don't be shy if you want us to pray for you.
Maybe God has put something on your heart and you would like for us to pray for you.